going to ground us a little bit because I'm sensing this time of we've got to get out of here very soon. And so I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Imagine or think of somebody that you've mentored before who was struggling. Imagine that they're going through something that's very scary. They're scared that they're going to screw up. They're scared that they're going to be judged. Maybe they're just scared because they actually made a mistake or had a bad outcome. Maybe they were just screamed at by a consultant. They were called too quiet, too bossy. I can't believe you just did that. Maybe they were told that they just won't get it. Imagine what they would be telling themselves as they blame themselves. Maybe they made a mistake about me. Maybe they would find out who I really am. Maybe I'm not good enough. I don't belong here. I spent all this time studying and learning, and maybe I'm not cut out for this, and I feel ashamed. And I feel like I've failed yet again. And you may have told them that you have to fake it till you make it. You may have told them that you can do it. I believe in you. Now imagine yourself in their position, trying your best, fumbling, but really trying hard, scared. I want you to extend that compassion to yourself. You are enough. And you are here for a reason. Now I want you to tell yourself, and I got this from another line, I'm having a tough time right now. Everyone feels this way sometimes. May I be kind to myself at this moment? May I give myself the compassion that I need? And I want you to remember that you are part of this group, and this group is very special. And we have very high standards here. And I believe that each of us can attain that. And what we're doing really, truly matters. So we're going to close up. Thank you for, for, for that moment. Um, at Stanford, we talk a lot about um, the professional fulfillment model uh, at the WellMD. And it talks about the culture of wellness, the efficiency of practice, and personal resilience. And really, there's an aspect of this that we can develop as part of resilience uh, as we deal with our imposter syndrome, as we deal with the microaggressions and the implicit bias every day. And part of that, and Dr. Rivera and Dr. Hernandez talked about this, is the concept of self-compassion. Kristin Neff talks about uh, the idea that you really need three things. You need to be kind to yourself. And it's not just, OK, I, I forgive myself, and it ends there. It has to be knowing that there's a common humanity, that we're not alone in this. And that's why at the very beginning, if you remember, we've talked a lot of things today. At the very beginning, I wanted to bring it back to each of us feeling the same idea of the imposter syndrome. You're not alone in this. And if you can believe that, then it's a lot easier to forgive yourself when we feel all these self-doubts and the flagellating whenever we make a mistake. And then the third part that's very important with having self-compassion is the mindfulness. And this is not about yoga or, or just the buzzword of mindfulness. It's actually just noticing, ooh, I'm feeling like I'm having to respond because I feel that I don't belong here. I, somebody questioned me. Without judgment, just acknowledging that, hey, I'm very present right now. I'm noticing this. Another way to deal with this is the concept of gratitude, right? So I... People who know me well, I always say, like, I can't multitask. I'm serially unitasking. And our brain is actually wired for that. And so whenever you're stressed out or you're feeling like you have the imposter syndrome, think of things that you're grateful for, right? Somebody said earlier, acknowledge that you've done amazing things already. Um, acknowledge that, that you have accomplished things so that you remind yourself that there is actually a reason why you're here. So I'm grateful for, I'm grateful for. And... The data shows by uh, Barbara Fredrickson is that you need about three or to five things of good things to think about to really negate that one negative aspect. So when I'm really nervous and I feel like I'm being questioned, you can step away and realize that maybe that other person is suffering and I'm grateful for, I'm grateful for, and it allows me 
to figure out a way to respond to that other person without engaging into a higher level of, of negativity. You can be alone in a crowded room, and this is even more uh, highlighted in underrepresented in medicine. And so we need to feel that we need to empathize with that idea. We talked about like resilience building, so maybe talk, so storytelling, something that we did here today, right? There's many things right now that's uh, being published on the concept of shame in medical education, which we don't have time to go over with. But in emergency medicine, we're actually very good at this. We have the airway series, so we talk about our stories, right? What Dr. Walker just did, like sharing her stories, like each of these and each of the participants here in the front, like shared our stories to normalize that we're not alone in this. Renee Myers talks about uh, diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. In our team and the lead um, program talks about how it's actually not just being invited, right? I can invite you right now to do a dance with me, but if you don't know how to dance, you'll feel isolated again. You're going to question yourself like, ooh, I got invited finally, I'm included, but I'm not really there yet. And I want to acknowledge that because sometimes you actually, and oftentimes, not sometimes, oftentimes you need certain skills to develop in order for you to feel included. And so therefore, eventually, you're going to feel like you belong. Like you don't care enough about anybody else. And there's supposed to be some buzz phrase here that I'm going to say. But belonging is knowing that you're so comfortable, you don't even care whatever people are thinking with your dance. Right? And that's when mentorship happens. And that's when psychological safety is important. This is our lead team this year that graduated. Um, again, it's, it's, it's over nine months of of intensive work on leadership uh, capacity building for our students, for our scholars, um, house staff, in order to then present nationally for events like this. And the key aspects of, of the LEAD program is the idea of mentorship. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to go so much about the, the, the topics of mentorship and sponsorship, because I know each of you are aware of that. And we can give you the handout. But it's very, very important because it matters when it comes to retention, right? It's very important because as a minority or underrepresented in medicine, there's a concept of you're dealing with the daily bias and microaggressions, the minority tax, like, oh, just because I'm, I'm, I'm this background or that background, I feel like I have to do more, or I represent the entire um, group. And we also know by data that 50% of underrepresented faculty members report having no formal academic mentorship. And so we must do something. And that's the idea of diversity 3.0 that Dr. Jasande was referring to earlier. Right? You've seen this already. And so right now I'm just going to go over what we've actually done at LEAD to hopefully inspire you to consider something like this in your program. Our program LEAD stands for Leadership, Education, and Advancing Diversity. We have a great cohort of about 14 residents and fellows combined. Dr. Richard Francisco has a lot of background teaching emotional intelligence. Everyone's engaging and learning from these workshops, but also hopefully teaching it on to the next generation or group. Part of that scholarly work is going to be May 18th when we have our first ever Diversity and Inclusion Day here at Stanford, where we're going to invite the broader Stanford community to showcase all of the scholarly work that our groups have been working on this year. In order to learn, grow, and celebrate from everyone's differences so that we can ultimately take the best care of our patients, we need a diverse workforce to eliminate health disparities. What we do as physicians is we try to really motivate and empower our patients to realize what they're able to contribute to the world. All these things that are important parts of our identity, we understand that it's a big part of our patient's lives. We don't really stop to reflect and think about how it affects us as providers and how we navigate the greater complexities of the healthcare system. The program really allows us to be introspective and reflective of our own experiences in relating to ourselves, relating to our patients, and also relating to our colleagues. I am so energized every night coming home from these meetings and thinking about the residents and fellows and what they're 
sharing the way our group has come together. It's been pretty incredible. So as we're wrapping up, this is a nice uh, story from one of the uh, scholars this year. On my desk, oh. there's a box. Of course, and the volume the just came out. the box has an inscription on it attributed to Lord Chesterfield. And the inscription is that in order to discover new oceans, you have to have the courage. Got it. Glad that worked. One of the scholars said that uh, I always felt I had something to say, but part of me thought that my voice shouldn't be so loud. The mentors in this program helped me elevate my voice and told me my ideas mattered as much as everyone else. They helped me have a sense of belonging amongst a world of accomplished doctors and scholars. And we get comments like this, and I really appreciate that. And somebody once said um, over the weekend at the Diversity and Inclusion Forum that diversity is just, you're just a number, you're in the background, but inclusion means that your word actually matters. You're part of the conversation. And I'm going to quote Teresa Smith here because she said appreciating diversity, and we did this at CORD, appreciating diversity and practicing diversity are not the same thing. And I can argue that I connected that with wellness because we have focused a lot lately on wellness, and it's actually very much intertwined. Focusing on wellness and focusing on diversity should be related, right? That's diversity 3.0. It has to be on a higher level of a mandate for us to be able to function very well in our institution. So this is a summary slide of what Dr. Gisandi was referring to from the diversity 1.0 where diversity is just an end for itself all the way to diversity 3.0 where faculty and academic leaders are key in order for us to be successful. You want to briefly talk about the capacity building? Oh, you have a microphone. A part of the lead program, so as um, one of the co-directors and founder for the program last year, um, we used this framework from Gerald G. Smith in academic medicine to really look at how to build out this program, understanding that oftentimes diversity work and inclusion work is done in silos and we don't use a collective effort to bring everything together, um, but also that it takes a part of looking at your climate and understand the intergroup relations that exist there, knowing that you have opportunities for access and success of your trainees of all diverse backgrounds, really looking at the institutional vitality, so who is your academic support? Do you have key state stakeholders um, who are a part of this, who are funding, supporting these programs, or not just existing for a year and then going away the next year because funding has run out? Um, and then also looking at the scholarship component because what we really want to show is that there is research to this and there's data that we can prove that having diversity and inclusion and really equity matters in terms of how we function as physicians but also how we care for our patients and really will impact their health. So this is a framework we use, so just something to look into as well. Thank you. Sure Everything is aligned with your mission. So this is from Vivek Murthy at the um, American Conference of Physician Health. And I really like this line. We are people responding to a calling. All of us can be part of that effort, and we are brothers and sisters in medicine. I want that to sink in a little bit. We've gone over a lot of things today. We talked about how loneliness in medicine is very common. We talked about isolation. We went from isolation to the imposter syndrome and then to gender um, inequity and gender bias in evaluations and the evidence behind that. We covered about microaggressions and how to deal with that um, at the moment as an institution um, and, and each of our roles. And we linked that all back to the concept of belonging and needing the psychological safety and mentorship. I hope each of you have taken one or two things from today's event. We really truly appreciate your work here with us I love the level of engagement, the stories that you've shared. And so what I'm, we're going to ask for you is to take out your phone, your email, and pick one goal that you personally would want to focus on after today's workshop. This is your accountability task, right? Because all of these are inspiring, but then after this, like the whole SAEM 19 is going to start really big, 
and we're going to be very busy with so many things. So I'm going to ask you to write down one thing. I'm asking for one thing. One goal that you personally would want to focus on. And also, so I want you to email that to yourself because the next one might not be the same. Pick something that your institution should address and also email that to yourself so that when you go back, you're going to be inspired by all the amazing things you're going to be hearing from the different workshops and lectures at SAEM. And I want you to think about that more on your flight back, on your drive back um, into your home institution. Again, this is the link. So if you're a bit.ly person, this is the bit.ly link. If you're a QR code person, this is the QR uh, code for the notes for today's events. It includes the schedule, all the handouts that we have. And then we're going to update it with the different pictures of the, the comments that you've given us today. Thank you for those. So those are very powerful. And we just want to acknowledge so many people um, in, in making this uh, workshop really, really uh, uh, successful for us. And so the, the lead uh, steering committee, definitely, especially with uh, Dr. Powell, uh, Powell uh, leading this. Uh, pediatrics has started the program. Um, and then, so initially it was the uh, Department of Pediatrics, and then it blew up to uh, seven uh, different programs uh, for this current year. And the next year, we're expanding all throughout uh, the university. And then we got a grant from the Teaching and Mentoring Academy at Stanford. 